please. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm just going to welcome, everyone. hi everyone. I'm going to take two or three minutes because the last time I was at IROS was four years ago. Uh, and at the time I was doing a lot of work on networked foresight and different approaches to using online crowdsourcing approaches to engage a larger group of people in the kinds of work that we all do. Um, I had also just started the National Foresight Unit within the Prime Minister's Office of the UAE. And since then, in the last four years, a lot of interesting things have occurred. And like many of you who work in the policy planning field, one of the main products that we produce are reports. Lots and lots of pieces of paper. Policy briefings, PowerPoints, reports, more reports, and more reports. And what I found interesting, because the UAE is such a dynamic uh, and rapidly changing place, we found less and less traction with this type of format, this kind of media. So if we're even, regardless of the ideas that we were using, uh, the medium itself was inhibiting the ability of us to communicate our message and indeed to produce the kinds of uh, education we were hoping in our senior policy stakeholders and in our communities, uh, and also perhaps produce some change. So I just want to take two or three minutes before I get into the weird and wild uh, version of the future of society, which I mentioned, to talk about the work that we've been doing since the last four years, because it might be uh, of reference. And, and thanks, Peter, for giving me the permission to do this. So moving from this kinds of report-based media, what we decided to do was, well, what is it that really engages our senior stakeholders' attention? And so we started to get into design-based experiences. You may have heard my colleague Stuart Candy talk about experiential futures. This has been called design fiction or speculative fiction. And we found this to be an extraordinarily effective and powerful way to engage not just community members and stakeholders, but our political stakeholders and patrons themselves. So, you know, we designed literal rooms that you could walk into and fictitious artifacts of the future that represented and embodied the research that went into a traditional foresight or policy planning process, but built it as something which you could touch and feel and interact with. And of course, all of these are spoofed technologies. This is an example which shows uh, what the public healthcare system of the future might look like. And it's actually a bathroom. It's your bathroom. It's a luxury bathroom. So you walk into your bathroom, and in the morning, as you brush your hair and wash your teeth, uh, it's providing, uh, you, it has ubiquitous sensors on your phone, in your home environment, in your toilet, at your work, connected to your social feed, and it's providing not only a real-time analysis of you and your healthcare, but how it relates to your colleagues and what kinds of preventative measures you might take. It's also very effective. So not only is it more exciting and interesting to engage with, because as you know, uh, as politicians and leaders and CEOs, time is extremely precious. So it condenses a tremendous amount of research into something which is uh, mostly nonverbal, which you can touch and feel in a very effective period of time. That gets people engaged in a more profound way. So for example, in this uh, future he healthcare system that's condensed into a smart mirror, we had this very deliberate act of the person having to check in. They scan their hand on this simple metal plate with a blue LED light. It wasn't actually doing anything. The whole thing is spoofing it to try and draw out some of the dynamics that is required, say, to interact in this world of ubiquitous sensors and AI doctors in a distributed public health fashion. But immediately, people started asking themselves this question. Wait a second. Uh, is this thing really scanning me? Who is reading my data? I'm not so sure I feel comfortable with this. Because when you are physically and embodiedly engaging in engaging the act of scanning yourself, it provokes an emotional and physical response in you. So you get that tingling sensation in your spine. I'm not so sure I'm comfortable with this. And naturally, this is exactly what I've been trying to get policymakers to understand as we brief them around the politics and ethics of a ubiquitous data society. Who owns this data? How do we protect it? Where does it go? How do we provide access to it? So in a very effective, concise, 30-second experience, you feel that experience. You feel that issue in a way which makes it personal to you. And it's far more useful than, let's say, a 200-page PowerPoint deck that you pay some management consultant millions of dollars to do. The other thing which we realize is it also generates demand. It generates these windows of political opportunity to act upon those issues and consequences. So this is a future classroom for early childhood education. It's a digital sand table, and it's very, very simple. It's just as you pile up sand uh, in, the, in this little table, you can virtual snow forms at the top of the pile of sand. You can wave your hand, and digital water falls down and runs down the side of the mountain and creates pools and lakes, and you can dig a ditch, and the water flows through the ditch. And you know, it, it's based on the most advanced learning around how children learn. It's constructivist learning. We learn best in groups. We learn best getting our hands dirty. We learn best engaging with each other in a social and, co and, and collaborative way. But without actually ever saying the words hydrology, 
geology, geography, ecosystem science, right? And so what's interesting is when I was giving the Prime Minister and the Minister of Education a tour of this uh, speculative exhibit, the Minister of Education looked at this, he said, oh, this is great, this is beautiful, I love it, I'll take 300. <laughs> and I was like, oh. you know, I'm thinking, oh no, Your Excellency, um, this isn't real. You know, this is just a speculative exhibit. And he looked at me like I was the idiot. And he's, you know, like, what am I paying you for? <laughs> you know, build me 300 of these, right? So it's an extremely effective way of engaging people and also shaping the issues around a, a, an optimistic narrative for how these might, uh, how these might enact. Ooh, some cybersecurity right there. Um, and in doing so, uh, you generate desire for that action to occur. So this is, this is a sort of a profound uh, application of foresight in an impactful fashion. We realize that this, there's actually a lot of legs to this. So for example, with emerging technologies like drones, we were asked to say, how could drones be used to improve people's lives? So we went out and we just created this little video in a couple of hours showing a regular citizen renewing their identity card. It went to the actual civil servants in the actual office where they, where they print out their cards. And we just put it on a drone and, you know, did this fake uh, civil service where you could get your do government documents delivered to you by drone. And we put it online, we weren't sure anything was gonna happen, uh, and within uh, 48 hours, we've gotten over three million views on YouTube. So as a political leader, this is quite profound because this generates a window of interest. There's a support for this, which we can then capitalize on. So we created this thing called the Drones for Good Award, which was a million dollar international prize to demonstrate prototypes where you could use drones for civilian uh, purposes. And this has had over 2,500 submissions from around 65 different countries. And I think was part and parcel of creating the shift in the public dialogue from drones away from CIA assassination devices uh, to you know, something which is a technology that might be useful in our civic life. Uh, we've done this again and again, and this is interesting how you can use design-based experiential foresight as a political tool to not only help policymakers and citizens understand the ramifications of these types of technologies and social issues, but actually shape those in a way which gets people excited about those and you can test them out. So this is a 3D printed building. It's the world's only fully functional 3D printing, I believe. It's the first and only. It's on my office in Dubai. And after we did this thing as a way to test out the potentials of 3D printing for uh, architecture, real estate, construction industries, which comprise about a third of Dubai's economy, when we opened it, the prime minister thought, okay, well done, you built one, where's my next 100,000? So we had to develop a strategy. We worked with the municipality to create the Dubai 3D printing strategy, which now by law commits the city to have 25% of every building 3D printed by the year 2030. And what that means is starting in 2019, you won't be able to get a building permit unless 2% of your building has 3D printed components. Like it'll start with doorknobs and, and, and fixtures and things, and every year in a market making capacity will increase that percentage 2%, 2%, 2%, 2% while it's providing lots of incentives for 3D printing companies to fulfill that demand. So this is all derived from uh, experiential view of how the future might be like a design-based articulation of what is good in that future and what might be worthwhile to pursue, and then a political support mechanism around that. We've done the same thing with blockchain, um, sometimes skipping the foresight entirely. It's quite clear that blockchain is not only the present but the future, and so what can we do about that? So we convened a network of over 65 different partners to create the, a blockchain council that, that asked us to create the strategy, and there we now, again, by law, 100% of Dubai's government transactions will have to be on some form of the blockchain by 2020, in the next three years. Uh, so this is extremely effective and also uh, engaging, and what we've done right now is we're creating this thing called the Museum of the Future, which is under construction now. It'll be open in May 2019. That'll be the sort of headquarters of the Dubai Future Foundation and a way of institutionalizing the, the use of design-based foresight and experiential foresight as what I like to call a speculative design policy creation tool. All right, so thanks for indulging me in a little update on what we've been doing in Dubai. I think it's relevant for our colleagues who are practitioners here. I have been asked to talk about the future of society and some of the forces that might shape it. So instead of making a PowerPoint, I've given you enough of that, I've decided to write a small one-act play, which I'm going to perform for you now. The play takes the form of a television talk show set in the year 2027, that's 10 years from now, with different characters representing different trends and issues that might affect us. It's intentionally exaggerated, and although you might think you recognize some of the characters here, it's a work of pure fiction. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. It's also based on some of the work we're doing at the Dubai Future Foundation, but this is an, a world premiere at IROS, so in other words, don't quote me on this. This is not official. Let's begin. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Real Feed, your weekly roundup of the most important issues and stories facing our world today. Today is Wednesday the 19th, 2027. In today's feed, we ask the question, what happened to society? Are we still of one cloth, or have we become, to paraphrase Margaret Thatcher, a figment of our own imagination? Joining us today are several notable guests who are going to be debating hot topics around society and how these trends might play out in the coming years of the 2030s. Our first question for debate is, foreigners, are they friends or enemies? We're pleased to welcome our first guest to debate this issue, Mr. Ronald Frump, whose wildly successful political campaign in the 20 teens was based in a large part on a platform of social exclusion and nationalist affirmation. After a brief stint in jail, Mr. Frump emerged as an even more popular voice against immigration and multiculturalism through his wildly successful virtual reality franchise, Frump's World that features real-time, crowdsourced, first-person reality casts of immigrants taking advantage of hardworking citizens like you and me. It's said to have over 670 million viewers each day and is algorithmically translated into 120 languages in real time. Despite his ignominious time in office, he continues to wield significant social and political influence amongst those who seek stronger borders, harsher immigration restrictions, and more nationalistic concepts of identity. He's particularly popular amongst the 90 to 120 year old set. Welcome back, Mr. Frump. It's good to have you on the feed. Mm. Taking the opposing view will be Miss Justine Truflot, a former politician who also rose to fame in the late 20-teens, but on a quite different platform, one of cosmopolitan integrationism, social kindness, and open immigration. She's famous for becoming the first world leader to completely open her country's borders, attracting some of the most skilled and talented refugees from around the world fleeing climate change and the collapse of foreign countries. This doubled her nation's population in under 10 years and kickstarted the so-called miracle of the North, which is particularly noteworthy because it occurred against the backdrop of the notorious Summer of Terror, which ripped across the world in 2021, bringing a wave of anti-immigrant sentiments with it. Welcome, Ms. Truflo. I'm sure this is gonna be an exciting debate. Let's open with you, Ms. Truflo. Why is multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism such an important part of today's world? Well, thank you for having me, Peter. It's an honor to be here. I think the evidence has shown that creating an economy and society that harnesses the best of human potential yields not only a more enjoyable present, but also a more successful future. With over 75 million climate refugees on the move, fleeing failed states and destabilized empires, we have to make a fundamental choice. Do we believe that there is room for everyone on this planet? That everyone's lives matter, equal to our own, and that every child should have a chance at building a better life? If so, we only have one choice, open borders, universal basic income, and social acceptance. My country has shown that providing open, welcoming arms to immigrants, as well as strong and generous social welfare support systems, can create a culture of acceptance that overcomes even the most difficult ethnic, racial, and cultural divides. Well, that certainly is fascinating, Ms. Truflo, but what about the 95% taxation rate required to fund this basic income, and your three-day work week? Yes, yes, it's true. We've had to make some serious accommodations to realize this, this dream, I agree. But no one can deny the social benefits that we've regained. Our education is among the world's best, our healthcare is second to none, and our happiness index chops the, tops the charts. None of this would have, been a, would have been possible if we clung to our old, outdated ideas of who we were and what a country was. Very inspiring, Mr. Flo. What do you have to say about this, Mr. Frump? Mm, fake news. <laughs> Everyone knows Truffo is a flack. Her numbers are fake. Her country's a dictatorship. There's immigrants everywhere, making babies, doing drugs, taking her jobs, listening to techno music. It's degenerate. I visited her country years ago. It was great, full of real men and beautiful women. Now look at it. Nobody wants to live there. That's why they have to take in losers who can't make it back in their own country. Stay in the North, I tell you. Our country is for red-blooded, hard-working, respectful people. It always has been and always will be. But Mr. Frump, how do you explain the fact that you've had so many domestic terrorist incidences, your education and healthcare systems are so poor, and you have to spend so much of your money on defense and border control? Fake news! Life is great in my country. We're better than ever, and anyone who says otherwise is a liar. Well, I can see this debate is going to take a long time, so let's move on to our second subject. Our second subject is your father or your friends. Who do you trust more? Here, we explore the changing relationship to authority and expertise amongst our youth. A growing number of people are rejecting traditional forms of authority, seeking out new means of social expression, self-expression, and new relationships about how they make meaning in their lives. 
An aging society, afraid to lose what it has built, and rigid bureaucracies often out of touch with the citizens can only exacerbate this trend. Interestingly, this expresses itself in two ways. First, in liberal cultural expressions, like the growing acceptance of LGBTQ communities and alternative approaches to economic livelihoods, like co-working, co-living, and co-parenting, but also paradoxically in more conservative forms, such as anti-vaccination movements, climate deniers, and new religious communities. Representing the first view, we have Mr. Brody Brocoder, one of Silicon Valley's most popular social media influencers and self-appointed spokesman of the distributed self-organizing blockchain economy, PlayaNet, that encompasses over 120 million people worldwide and has 40 different temporary autonomous zone cities. Their decentralized post-commodity gift economy has been described as a system that, quote, promotes the values of individual expression and self-realization over collective sublimation and status hierarchies. How this even works, I'm not sure. But giving his huge influence on modern culture, we're happy to have Mr. Brocutter with us today. Representing a more conservative perspective, we have Reverend Falldown, leader of the Virtual Church of Conservative Grace, an influential movement created online that is both political and religious in nature stretches across borders in over 48 countries on six operating systems and claims to have over 190 million subscribers who pay a low monthly fee for moral guidance and homeschooled education. Debating them both will be Professor Ralph Schnaub, founder of the World Technocratic Forum, a longtime proponent of science and technology as a force for public good. Professor Schnaub holds 12 doctorate degrees and sits on 48 of the world's most influential boards. Let's start with you, Professor. What do you make of this movement to ignore science and turn away from institutional forms of leadership and authority? Well, thank you for having me. As studies clearly show, there is a multivariable relationship between education levels, scientific attainment, good governance, economic well-being, social stability, big data. OK, thank you, Professor Schnaub. <laughs> Very interesting. What do you have to say about this, Reverend? Hogwash. Just look how disconnected he is from the rest of us. How can you sleep at night collecting those fat paychecks from your boards, sitting there on your high castle with your AIs, pretending you know what's best for us? Have you ever done an honest day's work in your entire life? Okay, okay, thank you, Reverend Falldown. Let's keep this civil, please, please. What do you say, Mr. Brocoder? Well, the Reverend may be a religious nut, but he's right about the professor. In our network, we've seen through the lies and illusions of the techno-industrial political dream factory. Our parents have told us that if we studied hard, went to university, and got a good job, we'd be happy. But look where that got us. In debt, obligated to work in content farms as virtual assistants for rich people around the world, living in micro-flats and flooded cities, robo-policed and bombarded with advertisements 24 hours a day. And why? Why, when the means of post-capitalist production are at our very fingertips, where 3D printers can make, like, more 3D printers? Why should we listen to our parents? Why should we go to school? Life is too short. Seize the means of making meaning for your life today, man. Well, that certainly is a provocative viewpoint, Mr. Brocoder. Do you have any closing comments, Professor Schnob? Nonsense. Who do you think made your 3D printers? We have to do what we have to do, not what we want to do. Well, I'm very sorry to have to end this section of our show because we're running on time. There's clearly more to discuss. But before we end, I'd like to at turn to you, the audience, and share the results of our flash poll that asks you to rank the other most important factors affecting society today. Out of the 3.45 million submissions that we received in the last 15 minutes, you chose rising income inequality and class conflict as another major force affecting the future of our society. Let's see what some of you had to say. Singapore Surfer 84 says, income inequality is the black elephant in the room. It's the ugly truth that no one wants to talk about. Lonely in Brussels says, OMG. Unless we sort this out, we're totally wrecked, and I'm angry this isn't a bigger deal. Finally, Drowning in Dubai says, the more unequal we become, the more scared we are, and the less faith we have in our leaders. Well, there you have it, folks. Xenophobia and xenophilia, trust in authority versus the distrust of experts and rising social inequality. How will these trends affect our society moving forward? How will they influence our relationships with strangers and with ourselves as they continue to grow? Will the impacts of climate change, population growth, and an aging society lead to further xenophobia? Or can we work together to overcome these challenges? Join me as we explore these burning issues and more in next week's Real Feed. Until then, this is Peter Ho signing off.
Okay, so thanks for that. I know this was a bit uh, unorthodox, um, but I wanted to make the point. Uh, and the point is that most people experience these trends not as PowerPoint slides, as data, and as evidence that we as policymakers or academics might uh, relate to this, but actually as emotional experiences. They feel them. And so it doesn't really matter what the numbers say about the world getting better or for worse, because most people feel deeply uncertain about their future, and they're questioning our abilities of the elites to guide them. This is going to produce, to produce tremendous pressure for change in our lifetime and going forward. Each of these characters represents an obvious exaggeration of some of the fundamental issues that is driving social debate. These debates are already starting to occur now. And so while these trends might be somewhat less acute outside of American political life, I think it's nonetheless increasingly present in the social lives of young people across the world. This, of course, is powered by the internet, and augmented and virtual realities are only going to accelerate and exacerbate this. These trends might take a softer, por uh, softer form in Asia, but I think that uh, you see, even looking at mainland China today, a young generation that wants to define itself anew, free from the authority, or at least relaxed from the authority of their parents and the authorities, and without the memory of their country's founders. This is going to become increasingly true throughout the world. So identity formation is an extremely complex thing. It's multifaceted. The internet only enables and accelerates this. And as we move forward, these pressures are going to become more acute and more, uh, let's say, emotionally driven. This is not necessarily about data, although there's obviously does data to support this. So I want to end there and leave some time for discussion. I'd like to thank uh, Stuart Candy and Michelle Gergawi for helping me prepare this and rehearse this, and also thanks to Peter and the IRAS hosts for, for allowing us to do this. So thank you very much. Thank you.